everybody, my name is Belen Maya, and this is the video topic analysis for the November 2017 public forum debate topic for Champion Briefs. So the topic this month is resolved, the United States should require universal background checks for all gun sales and transfers of ownership. Right off the bat, you know this is going to be an interesting debate topic. So just to get a lay of the land, the way it works in the status quo is that federally licensed gun dealers already have to do a, uni a, a, uni a background check for people that are attempting to buy guns. So people go to the store, they fill out an application with basic information um, about their identity, and then these gun vendors um, cross-check that information with the National Instant Criminal Background Check System. And this is drawing upon information on criminal records and also mental health records that are provided by states and federal agencies. So the reason why this is even being debated is because there are exceptions to the requirement for background checks. And that includes things like gun shows, online sales, and transfers between people. Um, so in this debate topic, we're considering expanding the requirement for background checks, figuring out what the effectiveness of this would be, and then also what are the political ramifications. So all things that you, we need to consider as we go into this topic. That said, I do want to start off on some big picture warnings. The first being that, as you might imagine, there's tremendous political biases and just preconceived notions. You might have a judge that going into the round already feels very strongly one way or the other. So there are ways to deal with this. You don't want to leave the decision up to the flip of the coin or just if your judge happens to get um, like your argument for their own reasons, right? So one thing to do is just to try to come up with creative arguments that move beyond the traditional rhetoric that people are hearing in the media. Arguments that make somebody that's always liked background checks think twice. Maybe arguments that start on premises that everyone can agree on. For example, we all can agree that we want to diminish gun violence and jump off of that so that you don't seem like you're just appealing to one um, political ideology or another, but instead to just really sound analytical warranted arguments. That's how you can get around that issue. Um, another thing, and this has probably been said to you many times, but really needs to be reiterated, is that this is a sensitive issue. Um, people in the United States are affected by this on a daily basis. So because you don't understand who's going to be in the room when you're debating, and because it's just the right thing to do, make sure that when you're doing things like weighing lives against rights or however else the debate might manifest, that you're sensitive to the fact that real people are affected by gun violence and that um, it's more than just an impact in the debate round. Um, and then the next consideration before we dig into things is just the type of evidence that you're going to be dealing with. So this is a type of topic that is going to have up to the minute evidence because there are, because politics policies about about um, addressing gun violence are being debated all the time in Congress and in other legislative bodies. Um, you want to draw on a variety of sources, so you definitely want journal articles that have empirical research about how universal background checks have or have not worked in different states. Maybe comparative analyses of how this has played out in different countries and address their problems related to gun violence. Um, you also want to get into more legal type research, so look at Supreme Court decisions, um, look at legal briefs, um, and finally, definitely look in the news, look in the media, look at how universal background checks are received by the American public, what are the arguments that policymakers make when they have proposed this in the past, and why hasn't it worked when it's been proposed in the past. So really, really broad landscape of the type of evidence that you want to use, and that's what makes this topic so interesting. Um, another thing that makes this topic interesting, and I've already hinted at it, at it is that it's not going to be a traditional which side impacts the most lives, or not necessarily. Um, this topic, because it has so many different types of arguments, might be a very interesting argument about how we must think about the expansion of state power, or how we justify rights versus the potential more sort of like utilitarian arguments. So all very, very, very interesting, and it should make for very good debates. So digging into it more specifically. Let's talk about the pro side. So for pro teams, mo for the most part, violence and deaths related to gun violence are going to be the most important impact. And that's because pro team offers a sort of solvency. So solvency is just a debate word that means, hey, I have a potential solution. Um, and the way that pro teams might want to weigh this when it comes down to the end of the round is us suggesting that they have risk of solvency. And what that means is that 
even though the con team has probably done a great job at mitigating my arguments or defending against my arguments, there is an off chance that universal background checks will work. Maybe they're not going to reduce 100% of gun violence deaths, but they'll reduce something. Um, and maybe they won't necessarily work 100% of the time, but they might work sometimes. So because you have that risk of solvency, it's reason enough to vote for you because you're giving the judge something while the con team is giving them nothing. Um, many con teams might come up with interesting alternatives, but they have the burden to show that those alternatives are likely and that they're more effective. Which brings me to another point on the pro. Don't just say risk of solvency, universal background checks might be good. Come up with reasons why universal background checks are uniquely the best thing. Um, and just more warranted, more deep analysis as to why they're effective. So talking about this a little bit, um, let's talk about those loopholes, the gun shows, the online sales, things like that. So evidence that gets floated around a lot is that only 60% of guns are sold at licensed dealers, but there's also a lot out there on the internet that says that this is a really outdated claim that comes from evidence from 1994, and that most recent figures put it around only 20%. Um, that said, most experts still agree about closing this loophole, and then they agree that this would but lead to some sort of reduction, or at least create more obstacles to, to acquiring a gun, which then increases the time that it would take for a criminal to carry out something, which makes it less likely to happen. Um, more interesting evidence from an Estes of the Journal of Preventative Medicine talks about how the absence of universal background checks and mandatory waiting period laws are associated with a steeply rising trajectory of statewide suicide rates. So another thing to think about on this topic is don't just think about mass shootings and don't just think about suicide. Try to think about how all of these really unfortunate, really grim things come together to create the whole picture of um, gun violence and of whether universal background checks are a good idea. Um, when you're dealing with the evidence, it's important, and Kantians should definitely be on the lookout for this, that there isn't amazing evidence because it's hard to do controlled studies with this, because these laws have been in place for decades, and because they just, it, it's hard to sort of isolate the variables. People are just sort of looking at how it plays out in a real world scenario. So in, this, in the evidence that I just read you, it relied on universal background checks and mandatory waiting periods. So maybe when you isolate universal background checks, it becomes less effective. Um, there's other studies that talk about how the um, how universal background checks paired with requiring a permit, so requiring criminals to go to law enforcement and require and get a permit before then, and which then in, entails a universal background check before going to buy a gun, has also been very effective. But that's not what the resolution is asking, right? So con teams be on the lookout for the evidence that pro is citing, and pro teams try to find evidence that is as specific to universal background checks and only universal background checks as possible. Um, speaking about evidence, there's going to be a lot of things dealing with both comparative studies of different countries and then also just within the United States because some states do require universal background checks and others don't. Um, a strategic thing for pro teams to look at is the fact that this discrepancy, how some states do and some states don't, make it less effective for everyone. So for example, The Economist tells us that in Chicago, which has especially restrictive gun laws, more than half of the guns confiscated by the police come from out of state. So this is an extra thing that pro team could bring up as to why a, a national universal background check, because the resolution does say United States, would see benefits to everyone, even if we don't exactly see those benefits in the status quo. Um, Chicago has a high homicide rate but this evidence seems to point to the fact that it's because of guns purchased out of state, which means they're not being purchased in Chicago, all things to consider. Um, now, the impact here is definitely lives, and teams should, I mean, lives are one of the easiest things to weigh. You could always go for the old debate phrase, if you don't have a life, you don't have anything. Um, so that'll come before rights, that'll come before the economy, that'll come before all sorts of arguments. Um, you certainly are encouraged to deepen the analysis beyond just lives. For example, think about how communities are affected by gun violence. Think about how they might be bad for the economy, how they could be bad for people growing up, for, for childhoods, for etc, etc, etc. And that way you can be sure to be winning on the lives front and then be able to have really good comparative analysis on other sorts of metrics that you might want to use um, when, when it comes down to weighing the round. Um, Another thing for pro teams to do is to sort of come up with arguments that preempt or at very least clash very well against arguments the con is probably going to use. So con teams, many of them are going to be running arguments about political trade-offs, and I'll get to that in a bit. But pro teams can also have an argument here. So Jacob Berta's topic analysis talks extensively about this, um, where he writes that winning landmark legislative victories can give movements legitimacy. So rather than take the fire away from the anti-gun or the 
gun restriction movement, using something, uh, um, achieving something like universal background checks could actually give it extra momentum and um, lead to sort of the conversation shifting so that things, so that just the issue of gun violence is being dealt with better, in a, in a better way. Um, and then another interesting pro point is just that support for universal background checks is high. Whether you're looking at Pew, 538, or various other polls, um, most Americans do support universal background checks. So even if it weren't for its efficacy, but because it's just sort of the way to be most responsive to the electorate and what people want, universal background checks on the whole look like a good idea when you look at it from that perspective. Now let's turn to the con. So considerations for the con side. Um, the first thing that I already talked about when I was talking about pro is just this issue of evidence, the type of evidence that pro teams are going to be using. Make sure they're not conflating universal background checks with other things and just really, really press them on it because you don't want to lose um, a round to a study. That's always the worst. Um, the other thing about con that I already also sort of touched on is just the fact that because this is so politically divisive, you want an argument that doesn't, and, and because most Americans, according to the evidence, support universal background checks, you want an argument that's a little more um, nuanced and more complex and more creative. So start on the premise that reducing gun violence is good, probably. You should do that. Um, be careful when you're weighing against lives. So think to really, really draw a case that universal background checks aren't effective and that they come with a whole array of other problems. Um, keep in mind that even though you have a sort of slightly more complicated link into lives, you certainly can find arguments that link into lives, and I'll touch on that in a sec, but also not to shy away from other impacts, because the best debaters that are going to be able to provide persuasion and reasoned analysis are going to come up with great reasons that have to do with rights, that have to do with the expansion of state power, um, that aren't specific to lives but are still great reasons to vote for your side. So the first thing I want to say on con is that you don't want to run a mitigatory case or a defensive case. Remember that your constructive, your first speech, is for offense, and then your rebuttal is for defense, and offense if you want to turn, throw in some turns there. Um, this seems obvious, but I really fear that con teams are going to resort to a lot of mitigatory stuff, because that just happens to be a lot of the literature on this topic for the con side. Um, and even though that may be true, that's not a reason, like, this mitigatory defensive stuff is true and it is important. It isn't a reason in and of itself for the judge to vote for you. When the round ends, you don't want the judge to just say, hey, pro team didn't win. You want them to say, con team actually won. Con team had offensive reasons why universal background checks aren't just not great, they're downright bad. Um, that said, defense is important because it's part of a sort of double whammy strategy for the con, which is first to show that universal background checks aren't going to work, and then to show that in addition to not working, they're actually bad because they create a bigger black market or they take away from all their political alternatives or things like that. Um, so let's analyze a little bit further into this idea that they might not work. The Hill tells us that 40% of all crime guns are acquired from street-level dealers who are criminals in the black market business of peddling stolen and recycled guns. And furthermore, um, the other 40 another 40% are by personal transfers between family members, between acquaintances, etc. So You'd have to look into the topicality here, and it's just some of the definitions of the resolution, but it seems unlikely that just gifts within a family are counted among transfers, and probably even more unlikely that a family member would actually comply with a background check if they were just giving a gun to somebody within their family. Um, which leads to another big issue, which is just compliance. Like, is this going to be enforced? And actually, evidence from Washington and Colorado states with universal background check laws suggests that, they're, that they don't. That after the, laws, the law came into place, the number of background checks didn't actually increase. Um, so, yeah. Due to this evidence from the Hill, we see 80% of crime guns are already outside of retail distribution channels. That's a very compelling argument that is mitigatory, but does tell us that universal background checks wouldn't necessarily work. Um, then we could expand that even more, right? So this is an oft-repeated argument, but if a bad guy wants a gun to, to, to do a crime, they're going to find a way to get a gun, and they're likely to do this through the black market. So the black market will continue to exist, it exists in the status quo. Um, it, the universal background checks wouldn't do anything to address that, right? Like, the reason crime is illegal is because it's not complying with the law. This is just one more law, but it wouldn't get rid of crime. Um, another weakness of universal background checks is that this database, the 
um, an ICS database can only search information that is submitted to it by federal and state agencies that have this sort of information on people, and this information is incomplete, and agencies can refuse to comply, right? So a lot of um, crimes that have, that have popped up in the, in the news show that the people that committed these crimes would have actually passed the background check, and that's just because this, the databases are incomplete and doesn't have a full log of people's mental health history, their criminal record, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then there's another issue of straw purchases, which is the fact that oftentimes guns are purchased by somebody that could pass a background check and then given to someone else. So for all of these reasons, um, you can make a very, very, very strong defense that universal background checks simply are not going to work. Now, um, that alone, I don't think, wins you the round, because pro teams can always go back to the risk of offense. I think where you can win the round is if you pair this argument with an argument about trade-offs, um, or an argument about, for example, the, back, the black market increasing. So I'll talk about both of these. But long story short, with that defense, mixing it with offense is how you get even close to um, a winning ballot. So, let me first talk about this argument about the black market. And it's the idea, um, and Harrison Hurd talks about it this in his topic analysis, that shifting gun sales underground will fund criminal enterprises, potentially causing an increase in violence. So that's a very important argument, right? The black market already exists, but if you make universal background checks occur, and if people are right that, um, pro teams are right, that there's a deterrent effect to even trying to get a background check if you know that you might not pass it, then this black market among people that want guns and are intend to get them anyway will grow. And when the black market grows, when there's more money going into it and going into the hands of criminals and gangs and dealers and whoever else that are operating in this black market, then it just generally becomes more powerful and as a result has a higher ability to be violent and commit crimes. So if universal background checks only grow a criminal, make a criminal enterprise grow, then Definitely a bad thing from the perspective of saving lives, of reducing violence on the streets, etc. Um, now, this is going to have some defense to it, and the, def the defense to it might be mitigatory, but something that you also want to make sure that you establish in a contention like this is that this underground gun market would be easy to access, that um, it wouldn't be radically more expensive to the point that it um, deters. Um, like a significant amount of potential criminals, and that just law enforcement doesn't have a good grasp on this black market. And with all of those justifications, then you have a very strong, compelling point about how universal background checks would only actually might increase crime. Um, another branch of argumentation has to do with the idea that there's going to be um, mistakes in the universal background check system. So we hear about this all the time with examples like people with that are mistakenly put on the no-fly list um, having tremendous issues getting on a plane. Um, and in this case what we're dealing with is just innocent people, people that don't have any sort of detrimental history, not being able to get guns. So there's a few ways that you could frame this. Um, one way is to frame it as a rights issue. Insofar as the right to bear arms is in the Constitution, it is right rather in the Second Amendment, and it is a right for people in the United States, then if some people are being denied, denied this right, um, maybe disproportionately subgroups even might be targeted in this way, then you have a huge problem as far as making sure that everybody sort of enjoys an equal condition and equal treatment in the country. Um, so just on a rights level, there's a whole argument to be made there. Now there's also arguments, and the research of John Lott supports this, that delays in the background check system could increase violent crime. Um, and the reason that this happens is because oftentimes people that are innocent people that are trying to buy guns and in a timely manner are doing it for reasons of defense. So he finds actually that um, domestic crimes could increase as a result of people not being able to get guns for their own defense when they need them. Um, he also goes on to say that there's no real scientific evidence among criminologists and economists that background checks actually reduce crime, and that a 2004 panel of the National Academy of Sciences found that Brady background checks, and you should look into Brady law because it's very pertinent to this, didn't reduce any type of violent crime, nor have other later studies found a beneficial effect. So definitely claims to maybe be investigated in there, and that's another thing I wanted to mention when it comes to evidence, is that this topic, because it's so hotly debated and because sort of everyone has an opinion on it, is going to be a topic that's sort of susceptible to quote-unquote fake news, so watch out for the credibility of sources. However, if these claims check out, and I would try to find John Lott's study and indict it yourself, even if you're on the con, so you could anticipate pros and dykes to it, um, 
certainly an interesting point because then you have not only a rights dimension but also actually a safety and potentially lives dimension to the issue of guns and the issue of innocent people not being able to get them. Um, then we get on to the political issues. So there's a few ways that you can run this, and one is by looking at the trade-offs. So universal background checks would trade off with other policies for a number of reasons. For one, it could um, lead to this um, to people thinking that the issue's been solved, that the issue's been dealt with. That often happens with sort of symbolic policies. Um, legislators wipe their hands clean and they think that, the, so that, that they've done their job. Um, and that would definitely be detrimental to other alternative policies pass passing. And another way that this could happen is by creating a really intense um, reaction to universal background checks, which would almost certainly happen. So Erda also expands on this in his topic analysis, and he talks that he says that passing some policies hurts the ability of others by draining political will, and it can actually embolden social movement or create coalitions. So. The obvious group to look at here is the National Rifle Association. If universal background checks passed, they would likely see a ton of extra support, a ton of more um, donations and money coming into them, and they'd likely increase not only their lobbying effort, but also their advertising efforts. Um, and that could lead to a couple of consequences. One, it could definitely lead to the um, non-re-election of people that supported universal background checks, which could be um, troublesome down the line for other gun policies. It could lead to other policies just point blank not getting passed because there wouldn't be the political capital or the political will to do it anymore. Or it could lead to a rollback um, of a universal background check law. So a rollback is problematic because it's not just, it doesn't just take away all of the pro team's benefits, but it also could, it comes with the extra harms of um, the political capital being drained and nothing being achieved because the universal background check law wouldn't even exist. So. Very, very interesting arguments to, to consider here, and the example that he gives is the what happened with affordable health care during the Clinton administration. Um, he explains that anti-expansion groups formed. They did exactly what I'm saying the NRA might do, which is just spend a ton of money on advertising and lobbying, and as a result, um, subsequent things were very, very, very difficult to get past. Um, rollback also comes in the form of arguments about constitutionality. So here's the place to look into the legal briefs and look into the Supreme Court cases, but if you can make a claim that it's not, um, it violates people's rights or it violates um, people's rights according to the amendments, or it just does create troublesome issues as far as privacy is concerned, then there's A, the question of, well, that's bad in and of itself, and B, the question of, would this lead to get rolled back? And that relates to all the issues that we already talked about. So looking a little bit more specifically into this issue of privacy, according to The Hill, um, there is some agreement among lawmakers that to achieve any degree of success, universal background check systems would require universal gun registration. Now, lawmakers disagree very intensely on this because people that have um, proposed universal background check laws that have an intention of them being politically feasible and actually passing are adamant that registration systems would not happen. However, people that are fearful of universal background checks think that they necessarily go in hand in hand with registration. Um, and if they didn't come with registration, then they really, really wouldn't work. So you would have to prove the link here that, that, that it's even true that registration would happen. But if it does, then that is could be construed as an, an, as an infringement of privacy, because then the, the government would have a record of who has a gun. Um, and in a sense, to the extent that you could sort of align gun with expression, um, it just more generally a right that Americans have, then you, you get into a whole other um, realm of issues. Um, and long story short, I mean, it does constitute an expansion of government power if universal background checks come into play. So if you can find a way to weigh these arguments in a compelling way and to prove that universal background checks wouldn't reduce gun violence, then I think Kantians can actually make a very, very compelling point. Um, so. November is a great um, uh, month to debate. For you seniors, maybe your early rounds of college applications co have already been submitted, and good luck to you. Um, November, I always used to go to Blue Key, which just wrapped up, the Glen Brooks tournament, which is a ton of fun and a very competitive and sort of high stakes, interesting field, and just a bunch of locals in South Florida. But wherever it is that you're debating, whoever you're debating against, I hope that this topic is a great opportunity to sort of challenge your weighing muscles um, to expose you to lots of different types of evidence and to just make you a more informed person about one of the most important political issues that are being debated all the time. Um, when teens
teams have to sort of go out of their way to come up with creative ways to compel judges that have political biases, it might be frustrating and you might have some decisions that you're not happy with, but it is absolutely an incredible learning opportunity. Um, and above all, I always say this, but make sure you're having fun because that's why we do debate. Good luck. <laughs>